Hello, can uh, everybody hear me? I just want to check and make sure the sound's working before I get started here. Oh, uh, this is Jacob Salm speaking. Um, I can certainly hear you. I just had to unmute my, my microphone first. Excellent, excellent, great. And I'll go back and mute. Thank you. Good good to see uh, so many old friends uh, on the uh, webcast here. This is going to be uh, a lovely uh, a chat. Okay, so let me let me get started. I'm sorry, there's a question. No, just an information. I can hear you in Germany as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have uh, people from around the world here. Um, that's great. So let me get started. And uh, I'm Lester Knudsen with Advanced Data Tools, and I'm going to talk about optimizing the operating system. Uh, Unix and Linux for uh, Informix. And uh, this is another in the series of webcasts. We try and do one once a month. Uh, we took a break for a couple of months at the beginning of the year, uh, and then Tom started up again, and, and uh, we have a whole series planned for the rest of the year. So I've been working with Informix since 1983, and uh, I had the, the opportunity at 83, I was working uh, with a customer uh, that got a new box, and uh, it was running Unix, which nobody knew. Uh, it came with C, which no one knew except for me, and uh, it came with a database called Informix. And it was a BBN C70, if anybody remembers those uh, from way back in the day. Anyway, it was a, a wonderful opportunity because I got to learn Unix and I got to learn uh, Informix at the same time. And, and being both the Informix uh, admin, the, the Unix admin, and the, the programmer uh, for this one box and building applications uh, for these people was, was an absolute blast. And that was the sort of start of, of everything I did. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, the operating system side of it today. A couple of guidelines. The webcast is being recorded, and uh, it'll take a couple of days, and we'll have a replay up and available. Uh, please keep your line on mute, as any background noise tends to distract uh, anybody. There is a chat button. It looks like this uh, button right here uh, on your screen. Uh, use that. and. Uh, I see a lot of you have found it already. Uh, if you have a question, uh, put it in the chat button and, and put it to everyone so everyone can see it. Um, as I'm talking, uh, I may miss it right now, but I'll come back at the end of the webcast and go through uh, all the, uh, the chat questions that we have there. So first thing I'm going to do is talk about some basic operating system tuning for Informix uh, on Linux. And then I'm going to talk about uh, operating system stats you need to be collecting and the Unix utilities uh, to monitor uh, your, your server. And then I'll describe some performance uh, metrics or some performance goals. Now, the uh, examples I have here may vary uh, with your OS and your version. Uh, there are multiple flavors of Linux out there, and, but they're all going to be about the same. So let's start with the operating system. And the first place to always start every time you get a new release of Informix is go look at the release notes because these change uh, potentially with every release and with every port. I'm working with a number of clients porting from AIX to Linux. And you have to go look at the release notes because they're different for AIX to Linux. And the simplest way is if you go to uh, wherever you installed Informix uh, release. Uh, in the US, it's under the ENUS for the language US uh, and the part number. There'll be something called IDS machine notes. And you want to open that up and uh, read through it. The part that I think is kind of important is system configuration. This will have the 
basic recommended uh, kernel settings uh, for your operating system and is really a good place to start. Uh, if your server's been up and running for 10 years, it's a good place to go check and uh, see if uh, those have been done. I've, I've been surprised at the number of sites I've been at, and uh, I mention that, and, and people look at me and say, oh, I didn't know we had to do that. Now, the key part in the release notes is the system configuration and the kernel parameters. Those are the two things you'll want to look at. It also tells you other things about how it was compiled, uh, what things are supported, what may not be supported. Uh, but the key is the kernel parameters. And so let's, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, kernel parameters and memory. And this is kind of important because Linux and Unix uh, and most operating systems are designed for thousands of little programs to run. Informix is one big program. It's one big process, one big memory hog. And uh, it's completely different from the way most uh, operating systems are designed to operate. And so there are a couple things you want to do. Uh, shared memory max is one of the first parameters. In the release notes, it recommends a huge number, uh, which is actually bigger than the default uh, uh, for uh, Informix. The one that I think is more important is the shared memory all setting, because that sets up uh, how much memory, shared memory can be used system-wide in pages. And uh, by default on Linux, it's going to be in 4K pages, even though Informix uses 2K pages. Remember, this is operating system pages, not Informix pages. And uh, it's quite a lot. Uh, you, can, you can go in and tweak it. Uh, what will happen is if you set this to lower than the amount uh, of, sh of shared memory you have or need, uh, you will get an operating system error when you hit that limit. Uh, the Informix release notes have it set at 16 gigs for most Linux. And so if you have 64 gigs of, of memory on your box and you go with what the release notes say, as soon as you hit 16 gigs of Informix memory, you may get an error. Uh, here are some of the other settings. The shared memory all is the one I think is is probably the most important uh, of them. And uh, what you do in Linux is there's a file etc sysconfig. Uh, you need to be root to edit it, and that's where you go edit and make these changes. And so I'm just going to view that file on my box. Uh, let me get the right name right. And uh, I usually uh, keep the defaults, and then I make a comment where I added my changes. <coughs> and you'll see here, these are a number of uh, changes that I have made. I've increased the uh, shared memory max, the shared memory minimum, uh, the shared memory all, and the number of semaphores that can be run. Uh, how swappiness is, is Unix. Uh, there are a couple of settings. I like to set that to one, uh, which makes it less likely to swap. Uh, how many files uh, you can have open. Uh, this is the max number of files. If you have a lot of processes running, you may want to set that. And then the number of bytes for uh, AIO or KAIO uh, and having those set up. So this is just an example of what I use on our training servers here. Now, a second part of memory is huge pages. Uh, every time a application on Linux needs memory, uh, it goes to the operating system and says, give me some more memory. And the operating system gives it a small chunk of memory. And uh, it may end up giving it thousands and millions of small chunks of memory. 
And those small chunks of memory are very inefficient to manage. So one of the things you want to set up is huge pages, which will tell the operating system to give Informix or anything that asks for it bigger chunks of memory. And uh, you'll see a message in the online log when this is, takes effect when you start in Formix, when it goes out there and gets huge mem page memory. Now, you can do this on AIX, you can do this on Linux, uh, multiple ways to do it. I'm gonna show you how to do it in Linux. I've got a little program here uh, that goes out, and if you cat proc mem info, it will tell you uh, and do a grep for huge pages. It will tell you how many huge pages have been set up and how many are free right now. So if I go out and cat that, It says, ah, you haven't set up any any uh, huge pages, and that's true. I was, I'm was i running a benchmark test on this box, and I wanted to try it without huge pages set up. Um, once you've started in Formix, it's very difficult to set huge pages. Um, you Actually, the best time to do this is when you do a reboot. And I have a little script here I use. Uh, the command uh, to set huge pages is uh, syscontrol minus w and uh, give it the number of huge pages to set. Um, and this will go out and, and create uh, huge pages on your box. Let's uh, just give you an example. This will probably fail uh, because I am running uh, a bunch of stuff already. And uh, let's just say I want to set up uh, 200. Oh, it worked. Uh, let's make it bigger. Let's set up five, uh, let's set up 1024. And uh, it did go out and get some huge pages. Um, and then it will come back at the end and tell you how many were set up. Now, I have a worksheet I want to show you. And uh, this, is, this is how I used to calculate uh, between pages and KB. So if... Uh, you have 16 uh, gigs of memory. Uh, that equals uh, 16,000 uh, megabytes. Uh, huge pages are 4K each. And so that's about 892 uh, huge pages. So when I was back here, uh, say 127, I'm doing 127 times 4096. Uh, that's how much memory I'm using for huge pages. Huge pages are done in uh, 4096 increments of megabytes. Now, if you set a number, let's just do this um, ridiculously huge, it couldn't do that because there's not enough free memory right now to, to set up uh, that many huge pages. And so it gave me the most it could do. Again, it's a very simple uh, command uh, to, uh, to enable huge pages on Linux. Uh, you can put this in your startup uh, scripts. Uh, that's what I really recommend you do is, is set it when you reboot the, the machine. Uh, the only way I can get it on this box uh, the box I'm running has 16 gigs of memory. Uh, the only way I can get 16 gigs of huge pages is to do it when I reboot the machine. So nothing else is running. Once something is running, like in Formix, it's got some memory. Memory cannot be part of the huge page pool.
So going back to my worksheet, uh, each huge page is uh, 4096 megabytes, and um, you you give it the number in pages. And uh, if I wanted to give it 16 gigs, I would say 8,192 huge pages. And uh, if that's available, that's what it would give me. Now, disk I.O. Second thing on the operating system, uh, you want to spread the disk I.O. out as much as possible. And the best way to do it is RAID 10. Uh, I've tried various different configurations. Art uh, Kegel, uh, my good friend and colleague, can talk for hours about why every other form of RAID is bad. The one, only thing I'll say is RAID 10 is faster. Uh, because what it does is it stripes your data across multiple disks, so you can read from multiple disks at the same time. Uh, and if you have it mirrored, which is what RAID 10 does, uh, you can read from both sides of the mirror at the same time. So every read request uh, gets split between the two uh, mirrors, and data can come back twice as fast. It, it's just very simple. This is the fastest configuration. Uh, RAID 5 and all the other RAID uh, is not going to be anywhere near as fast as the RAID 10 configuration. Now, spinning disk uh, look like this. There's an arm, and that arm can only be in one place on the platter at a time. Uh, that arm moves back and forth on this platter as the spinning disk goes under around it. So that arm can only read from one place at a time. And the sweet spot on spinning disk is going to be the center of the disk. Uh, there are some disks now that have repacked the data, so maybe the sweet spot might be on the outer edge. Uh, but there's usually going to be one part of that disk that's the sweet spot. SSD drives are completely different. And uh, the benchmark I'm running here in the background is on an SSD drive. Uh, we use SSD drives almost on everything nowadays. Uh, an SSD drive doesn't have anything that's spinning. It's a bunch of chips. And uh, the data is spread out by your SSD manufacturer onto all these cells. And you can access these cells uh, very quickly, uh, very fast, and at the same time. Uh, one of the things I thought was really interesting, um, I've, I've got ver various SSD drives of various types and various sizes. There was a sale for some cheap uh, 128 gig SSD drives. And I thought, oh, great, uh, good manufacturer, good sale. Uh, I got them, started testing them, and they were slow. Uh, they were almost not even worth it. They're faster than spinning disk still, but they're really slow compared to all my other SSD drives. And part of the problem is an SSD drive, the bigger it is, and, and this is what I've been seeing over and over again, uh, on an SSD drive, the bigger it is, the more cells it has, the more your data is spread out and it can be read at the same time, the faster it seems to be. My uh, fastest SSD drives are two terabyte uh, SSD drives. And uh, get, get, getting a couple of two terabyte SSD drives uh, are really great. A spinning disk is kind of the opposite. To get that kind of parallelism, you have to have multiple uh, disks uh, because it can only read from one point at a time. On an SSD, it can read from all these cells at about the same time, and it's much faster, and that's that's where they're kind of fast. Now, for your database, just something to keep in mind. I'll, I put this uh, talk about this in my my courses. Uh, the reds are your writes, the uh, greens are your reads. Uh, most of your writes will be to your logs and to your tempdb space. Uh, in fact, I like to say two-thirds of your writes will be to your logs and your temp DB space. Uh, your reads will be uh, primarily from uh, temp DB space and then data uh, DB space. 
So you want to plan your disk layout uh, accordingly. Uh, you want your logs on a device that is going to be read. Uh, putting a physical log on the same device as TempDB space is probably not a good idea because they'll both get hit quite a bit. Uh, and, and you want to do some planning and spread this out. Now, Linux, and this is just Linux, uh, has three disk I.O. schedulers. The no-op, uh, the deadline, and the CFG. Now, typically, the deadline and the CFG are the de defaults, depending on whether you have SSD drives or spitting drives. The no-op scheduler is uh, designed for when you have a device or a, or a program that's going to manage the story, the storage itself, like an on-init process uh, or like a multi-path um, controller or an intelligent controller in a disk array. And uh, I've been doing uh, some performance testing with this. Definitely the no-op uh, is, is much faster uh, when you're running Informix. And so one of the other operating system uh, things you'll want to change is to change from whether it's CFG or deadline uh, to no-op for Informix. And the way you look at it is uh, you cat uh, sys block SDA queue scheduler, and it will tell you by where the brackets are which one is the default. And uh, if you echo uh, it to scheduler, you'll change it. And let me just give you a quick example of that. Um, And it tells you right now on this disk, deadline is the uh, default scheduler. And uh, if I press return, it's going to change it from deadline to no op. So deadline, uh, which is for SSD drives, and I'm running on an SSD drive, was the default. I just changed it. Uh, on the fly to no op. Again, this is a, a something you can put in your startup scripts. Scripts. So every time you start your Linux server, uh, that change will will take effect. Now, CPUs and hyperthreading. Um, this is kind of important. Uh, most good CPUs. Uh, well, let's talk about some terms first. Uh, you've got a socket, and then each socket is a physical processor. Uh, each socket nowadays has multiple cores. Uh, almost every socket has at least two cores. Even the cheapest little PC socket you get will have two cores. Many will have many more. And then each core may have hyperthreading turned on, which means each core can run multiple threads, uh, not at the same time. And this is the key thing. A core can only run one thing at a time. What it does is when that uh, one thing that's running has to wait, it can then run another thing. And that's what hyperthreading is. It's using uh, taking advantage of that wait time. Now, if the one thing running doesn't give uh, any wait time, that means the other hyperthread is almost never going to run. And that's, that's one of the problems you get into with databases like Informix. Informix can keep a thread busy all the time and may not leave enough uh, free cycles for the hyperthread to run. Um, now, another point is chip speed, which is measured in gigahertz, and uh, then an IBM has something called value process units, which is how they determine licensing. And uh, I'll, I'll leave that uh, for another session. So here's an example. I have two green boxes. Each box is a core, a uh, socket, excuse me. Uh, each socket has five cores. 
uh, each of the five cores has two hyper threads. So that means I have 10 cores and eight virtual cores. To the operating system, it's going to look like there are 20 cores on this box. But again, only 10 things can run at the same time. Uh, the second thread only runs when the first thread is blocked. So how many cores can you use for Informix? Part of it depends on what else is running on the machine. The traditional uh, best practice was a number, number of uh, physical CPU cores minus one. However, with the faster cores, uh, you can run uh, two to three on an its uh, on one core, or the rule I use is about one on an it per, and I usually use a thousand megahertz, even though uh, you can you can do it for less. Um, so if you have a 3,000 uh, megahertz chip, you can run three on an its uh, per core on that chip. And uh, like the boxes that we have here in our classroom that I'm using for this, this uh, thing, if um, I, I look at them, uh, they're uh, one socket. The socket has four cores and each core has hyper threading turned on, so they're running eight cores. If I run something like top, it will uh, say that, uh, it doesn't tell me that up there. Uh, anyway, I'll come back to this. Uh, it'll, it'll show you that it has eight cores running. Now, AIX has the same kind of thing, and uh, you can you can take a look at, at AIX hyper threads. Uh, so you want to test this very carefully, uh, but turning on hyper threading may not be the best. I, I did a, a heavy duty benchmark uh, with 48 cores uh, recently in a, in a Intel environment. Uh, that was 48 cores, uh, 90, six uh, CPUs is what it looked like uh, to the operating system. And turning off the hyper-threading and only running 48 cores and 48 CPUs, uh, Informix is able, able to keep those busier faster uh, than having the hyper-threading turned on and the OS overhead of swapping between threads because there is some work that the operating system, the CPU has to do uh, to swap between two hyper threads. Uh, and so on Intel systems, you might wanna try uh, turning off hyper threading and running one on it per, per core instead of two. On uh, AIX, the recommendation is uh, on power six to run two SMTP threads on power seven, uh, I mean, power eight run four SMTP threads. And on Linux, uh, the best way, bump, bump, I, had, I just rearranged the slides. The best way to do this, I had this on the first slide. Well, let me go back here is to actually change it at the BIOS level, not uh, in the operating system. Uh, on Linux, I can turn off uh, hyper-threading uh, by disabling the second uh, CPU, but it's really gonna be enabled at the BIOS. You really wanna do this at the BIOS level, not uh, at Linux. Uh, this turns them off uh, and uh, this turns them back. Oh, sorry, this turns, uh, disables them, and uh, this turns them on. Now, let's talk about what you need to look at uh, from the OS uh, to monitor your performance. And you wanna track how busy your CPUs are, how much memory is being used, uh, how, how busy your disks are and what uh, the network utilization is. And I'm gonna go through now, uh, the second part of the presentation is the tools you can use to uh, monitor it. There are a bunch of operating system tools uh, that we'll talk about. 
here. Uh, you also have ONSTAT tools. The first one is SAR. SAR is uh, the System Activity Recorder, and it's been on Unix since I remember it. Back in 83, it was one of the first things I installed on uh, the Unix system uh, so I could tell what was going on. And back then, you set up a cron job. I like to have it run every 15 minutes. Today, uh, by default, you uh, set up a control, uh, system control, and you enable it, uh, you start it, and then if you do a system control status, it will tell you if it's running or not. Uh, you can check and just type SAR, and if you get output, then you know SAR is running on your system. Uh, if you don't get output, uh, it may not be installed, and if it's not installed, you want to just install the sysstat package for Linux. And this would be highly recommended to install this because uh, all the tools I'm going to talk about are in that in Linux. So depending on which flavor of Linux you have and how you install tools, do a search for sysstat and install it. And then uh, enable it and start it. And once you do this once, uh, and it will be enabled and started every time you reboot uh, your machine. Now, some of the things I like, there's a lot of SAR. A lot of it is old stuff that you really don't need. Uh, but the main things I like are the CPU utilization, the run queue utilization, and looking at the uh, disk activity by, by disk uh, device. Uh, it collects data and it saves it in a file uh, so you can uh, go out and look at it. Um, it's in a binary format, uh, so you can't just cat the file. Uh, you have to use SAR uh, to look at it. When I type SAR like this, it's going out to that file and saying, since the beginning of today, uh, 12 a.m., 12.01 a.m., uh, and you can see my system was pretty much idle uh, at the beginning of today. And um, then as I came along uh, at about uh, 9.40, I started a bunch of work on this system, and uh, it's, it's uh, not so idle, and it's been running ever since then. Uh, so this is sort of the default output of SAR. Uh, the key thing is the percent and system uh, percent, that's how busy your CPU is, and then the percent waiting for I.O., and then the percent idle. So the percent idle says it's not doing anything. The percent user and the percent system uh, are how busy the, the CPU is. Uh, one way I like to think of it is percent user is running user code, percent system is running uh, system calls, uh, operating system calls, uh, and then waiting for I.O. is it's waiting for I.O. Now, there's a real interesting article I just read, uh, and, and um, I see there are a couple of questions on the chat. Let me come back to them uh, when I'm done. It's, it's hard to look at two screens at the same time. Sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, there's, a, there's an article I was reading recently on, on this, and one thing it said is the percent uh, user and the percent sys uh, also includes the time the uh, CPU has to wait on memory and a context switch. And somebody was diving into this. This is kind of interesting. Uh, his point was slow memory. Uh, will show up as a very high uh, percent user and a percent, usually percent system, uh, because the CPU is waiting on memory, not waiting on I/O, but it's doing a system call to wait on that memory. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting. 
uh, to, to, to look at it that way. Uh, so here's sort of the definition of, of SAR. Again, the real one I look at is uh, I combine user and system together. And then uh, percent weighting on IO means it's weighting on your disk system. Uh, and then percent idle. And if you look at, at SAR that's running here, uh, everything is waiting on I.O. I'm doing a very I.O. intensive uh, database load right now. Uh, it's, it's one process loading a bunch of data and, and updating it. And so that's, that's really what my system is doing. I'm I.O. bound. Uh, and this is interesting. I'm on an SSD drive, and I'm still I.O. bound. Uh, SSD drives are still not as fast as our CPUs are. If I was, uh, and just as a, uh, a bit of background here, uh, this database, the one database load that I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing it in a loop over and over again. Uh, on spinning disk would take about two hours. Uh, on the SSD drives, uh, it, can, it can take about 20 minutes. Uh, so it's, it's quite a bit faster on SSD drives. And, uh, but it's still waiting on I.O. Now, let me just look at, there are a couple of questions. Um, how about the complete, I'm not sure I understand, Jacob, your question about the complete uh, timestamps. Um, on SAR, there all the things, all the timestamps are hour, minute, I think second as well. Uh, but um, if I want to get, um, if I'm going to look at the SAR report, it could be, you know, the one long report building up daily, it's just a file getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, I think. Um, I would want to see the timestamp, I want to see the, the complete timestamp in the, uh, in, on every message, and it's an option I, I've chosen. For example, in, in the um, in the online log, I pick that I, I set that option as well, so that every every message has a complete date and time. That, that's a good point. Yes, yes, you can you can get and you can see here. I have I have the the hour, the minute, the second uh, for all my star things here. Yes. So what? But if I wanted a complete date, can I get that, or is that that's just not an option? Oh, oh no, the date's not an option. The date is uh, right at the top of the file. So when I I use Perl scripts to parse this, uh, what I do is for each star file, I look for the date at the very top, and uh, there's some some default information that tells me, uh, and then then this gives me the the time. Sorry, I didn't quite understand your question there. Okay, so does the date, does that date, like when the, again, in the online log, you get, every time you get it past midnight, it gets a new, it makes, it has a special message starting a new day. Does SAR do that automatically as well? Well, SAR starts a new file every day. Good enough, thank you. Okay, that, so. That answers a whole other question as well. <laughs> we wish the online log would do. Yes, so SAR starts a new file. And, and a good follow-on question is, after 30 days, SAR overwrites the older file. It, it stores a file by day of month. And so every 30 days, it's going to overwrite uh, the last file. So if you want to SAR data, uh, you need to take it offline uh, if you want to keep it past 30 days. And then um, Mark had a question on SMTP. Yeah, I, I agree with you, uh, Mark, on uh, SMTP2 on AIX uh, Power 7. Um, good, good point there. Cool. Uh, well, let me dive on and uh, keep Keep the questions in the chat, and I'll go over the chat at the end and uh, and see how we how we're doing. Uh, one other SAR one I like is SAR minus Q, which tells you the run queue, and this tells you how many things are are ready to run. 
And the key here is uh, how many things, the run queue size is how many things are waiting to run, and then how many things are blocked uh, from running. And blocked means you don't have enough CPU power to, to run these things. And uh, that that's a indication that you may want to uh, add more CPU. So if I come over here and do SAR minus Q, and uh, you can see that uh, I've got right here two things running. I still had one thing blocked. At one point, I had four things blocked, waiting to run. That gives you an idea over time of uh, what, uh, how busy your system is. And if you have too many things blocked, uh, it's something to be concerned about. Uh, SAR minus B gives you the IO uh, transfer rates. And uh, this is kind of, of handy to take a look and get to know your reads and writes uh, per device. Uh, IOSTAT also does the same thing. Uh, and I, I like to look at the transactions per second, uh, and it has read and write transactions uh, per second. Uh, this shows you the split. As you can see from this, I am in this benchmark here, and this is similar to what I'm running right now, mostly doing writes. I'm not doing a lot of reads uh, on on my server. And uh, this will give you sort of a, um, yeah, uh, a transaction. Somebody asked the question, what is a transaction? It's think of it as an IO operation. It's a system call to uh, write or read something from disk. It may be a small few bytes, it may be a big few bytes, but it's a system call to read and write something from disk, which means it should get that whole back in one package. It's a package of data being read and written to from disk. Uh, VM stat, this is another real uh, helpful utility, and uh, this is usually on most systems by default. Uh, it gives you the uh, CPU usage. Uh, it also gives you the run queue and how many things are blocked. And so if I do VM stat uh, 5, 5, uh, what I'm saying by five is run this five times and do it at five second intervals. And I usually ignore the first line. Uh, on a lot of these uh, internal things, when you run them, the first line sort of is, uh, this is what the numbers were in the operating system buffers at that time. Um, the R means how many things are running right now. So I had zero things running. Uh, here uh, for the first three seconds of my run. But I had seven things blocked for those three seconds. And I have one thing running right here, and again, seven things blocked. Uh, it tells me uh, how much memory is being used. I really don't uh, look at that uh, very much because a good operating system, and, and all Unixes uh, do this, is they take all the free memory and uh, use it for file system cache. So you won't see that much free memory uh, unless there's nothing at all running on the system and it doesn't need any file system cache. Second thing I like to look at uh, is the CPU. And again, this is user and system, uh, idle, waiting, and stealing threads. Uh, this tells you how busy your CPUs are. The third thing I look at is swap in and swap out. You want to see those as zero. If they're not zero, uh, you're, you're swapping. Your operating system is paging, and that means uh, you don't have enough physical memory, and uh, it's had to swap something out of memory to disk uh, so that it could put something else in memory to run it. Uh, and, and Unix is designed to do that. Uh, the problem is on a database server and, and with the cost of memory right now, you really don't want to see swapping at all. 
uh, that will just slow down your performance to the, the speed of your disk. MPSTAT is uh, one of my uh, favorites for multiprocessor systems because this will show you how busy each of the cores are on your systems. This is an example uh, from a HCPU machine. Let's take a look here. If I do MPSTAT minus P all, um, tells me I'm pretty much idle. I wonder if my uh, little benchmark is finished. Uh, I'm creating an index there. Um, so it's basically saying all my CPUs are pretty pretty idle. Uh, and you can again do 5.5 five or 5.10, whatever. Show me uh, every five seconds, you know, 10 times and it will it will run out and tell you that. Uh, now, now it's showing me more realistic times. Uh, so these are telling me my actual cores. Uh, I've got eight, eight uh, cores. I'm sorry, eight uh, threads, four cores on this machine. The uh, four, five, six, and seven are the hyper threads. Uh, and then it tells me how busy each one is. It's a good way of monitoring to see if you're using all the CPU cores you have on your machine. Disk IO, IO stat, uh, again, and again, you can do IO stat five, space five, all of these you can do, you know, it's, it's number of times, number of seconds uh, that, that you want to show. And um, it will tell you uh, how much uh, I.O. you're doing. And uh, I.O. stat 5.5. Five. Again, I'm doing a lot of I.O. here. Uh, SDA is my one uh, SSD drive. And uh, you should see I'm doing all writes because I'm doing a big database load right now on this machine. And what, one of the reasons for watching this is you want to get to know what your machine does in a normal steady state behavior. Uh, I found this very helpful uh, to compare, uh, particularly if you're doing a SAN upgrade or if you're changing disk or they're moving VMs around, do this before the move so that after the move, if you have performance problems, you have some data to go back and look at. And then you can say, why is it slower after the move? Uh, or why is it faster? Uh, which is hopefully what happens after a move like that. Uh, if you have Veritas, I always like this. It has a, a volume manager. A uh, couple of other key things I want to sort of jump over these to get to uh, to my key metrics to look for. Uh, PS stat uh, gives you the uh, processes running and it tells you uh, what's running. The key thing is the size process uh, tells you the size, uh, how much memory each process is using. Uh, top is one of my favorite uh, Unix ones. Here's a, a more up-to-date Unix picture of it. Uh, this tells you a lot. It tells you the load average, which is how many things are running now, five minutes ago, and 15 minutes ago. So it's always showing you now, five minutes ago, 15 minutes ago. And then uh, it tells you uh, how many are running, how many are sleeping, how many are stopped, if you have any zombie processes how busy your CPU is right now. Uh, again, here I'm waiting on I, uh, I'm idle. I'm waiting on IO uh, quite a bit. Uh, how much memory uh, is being used and then what processes are taking the most uh, CPU command. If I run top uh, right here in the window, you can see on and it's 
should be the top process on this machine uh, overall. One last one to mention before I get into the metrics is NetStat. NetStat uh, is the way to track your, your network IO. And, and this is a key one. Uh, I've got a couple of stories I'll tell later on about this, but uh, you wanna see uh, your network uh, as fast as possible. And uh, in particular, uh, this will tell you packets in, packets out, and then how many errors, uh, in errors, out errors, and then how many collisions. A collision is when a packet went out, it had a collision, and it had to be reset. You want to see zeros there. If you see any errors or if you see collisions uh, at any number, that means you have a performance problem and you want to take a look at that. So let me share with you uh, metrics uh, that I use to measure things. And I'll be honest, there, there are uh, colleagues of mine who will disagree with me on some of these, uh, but uh, I'm going to give you my numbers. These are, these are my opinions. <laughs> uh, and feel free to disagree with me uh, on some of these, but I, this is what I use to monitor. Uh, the first is, are your CPUs overloaded? And my metric is that you want to see your CPUs at below 30% busy. Uh, that's good. Uh, 30 to 60% busy is fair. Over 60% is poor. And it's very simple. Um, if your CPUs on average are at 30%, that means you can handle spikes in the workload. And um, you want to be able to handle spikes. Everybody has spikes in the workload. Look at, looking at the CPU on a normal uh, time may not tell you the real picture. Uh, I work with a number of universities, and they usually have a spike every time registration happens. Uh, their system will be idle, uh, it seems like, and then registration will happen, and they'll have a two-week spike. Uh, and you've got to save CPU cycles for that or else the most important thing you do is students getting registered can't happen. The same thing with retailers. Uh, the Christmas season, we all know that. That's a busy season. You've got to have enough CPU cycles on your system to handle uh, it going up to 60 70% at Christmas. Uh, so that means it's got to be below 30% uh, most of the rest of the year. So this is my basic uh, metric when I look at look at CPU cycles. And uh, I always remember I, I uh, once uh, had a customer, I'd help them buy and configure a big Sun E10K with 64 CPUs, it was a big box. And uh, I went out afterwards to see how they were doing with it. And the manager uh, said, I have a complaint. Our CPUs are only 20% busy. I said, that's good, because if, if they were 60 or 70% busy, you'd have another complaint, and that would be your users complaining at you. Uh, you want to see them at about 30, uh, less than 30% busy. And you need to look at that uh, over the course of a day. Uh, here's an example uh, from a long time ago. 7 o'clock in the morning, everybody comes into work, boom. 61% uh, busy. Uh, then it comes down later on in the, in the day. Uh, you want to look at that uh, to see what's happening. The other thing you want to look at is the run queue. How many things are waiting to run? And my rule of thumb is uh, about two per CPU uh, or less is good. Uh, two to four per CPU is fair, and uh, greater than four things ready to run is really bad. Uh, if you look at uptime, uh, this will tell you uh, what your load is. Top tells you what your load is. There are a number of utilities that tell you what your load is. and. You need to multiply it by the number of CPUs. So on a four CPU, you'd say two times four, uh, that's good. 
two to four times four, that's going to give you fair. Uh, greater than four waiting to run is really bad. Now, memory monitoring. This is uh, very difficult to do because in real time, the operating system is going to use all free memory uh, for file system uh, cache. Uh, but it's very imp important, and the key is to look at swapping. Uh, this is really the key thing, is to monitor your swap space and the page in, in, in and out. Um, if you see page in, page outs, or uh, swap in, swap outs, uh, then you've got swapping going on. You don't have enough memory. Uh, you want to see zero swapping. Uh, here's an example with, with uh, VM stat. You want to see the SI and the SO column as zero. Now, to identify what processes are using the most memory, look at top, look at uh, PS. Uh, these will tell you what's using the most memory. Sometimes it's informics. And uh, it's, I always think it's fun. In our performance tuning class, we have a lab where uh, we're running a benchmark, students add memory, run the benchmark again, add more memory, run the benchmark again, add more memory. Each time they do that, it usually gets faster. And there'll always be somebody who says, oh, I'm gonna add a whole bunch of memory. And then the system will slow down to a crawl. And uh, if uh, it's crawling, uh, that's because it's swapping out to disk, and now your system's only going to run as fast as a disk. The third thing you want to do is your di look at is your disk I/O, and uh, you want to put the I/O across all your disk. Uh, you want to find the fastest spot on the disk if you have spinning disk, and spread your data out. This is something I did years ago with spinning disk. Uh, it's an interesting uh, benchmark. There, there, there was a tool called PF Read uh, that someone at Informics had written uh, and put out in the public domain. And um, what I was trying to measure was how many uh, processes uh, could read a chunk at the same time. And I start out with one, and then two, and then three. And this sort of tells you how many AIO on and its could you put on a disk. And you see at about seven or eight, uh, the number keeps getting better, and then it suddenly drops off. And the best performance on most spinning disk is about eight, uh, maybe nine on and it pro processes per disk. Having more than that read a disk will, will, will slow it down. Now, the difference here is not that much. If you look at this uh, between five and, and nine, and so maybe it's not worth uh, having uh, going from five to nine. You sort of have to measure that yourself. Uh, here's the same data in a chart on a 32, uh, six gig disk. And you can see, once you hit the point where you have uh, nine on and it's reading stuff, it just goes, performance goes down, way down. <clears throat> so you want to monitor your disk uh, with SAR, and you want to look at how busy they are, the average queue, and the average weight uh, on those disks. And that's the old SAR report. Uh, example, but the new SAR uh, report I've only got one disk here, so there it's not going to tell you much. Uh, this gives it by by disk. If I go all the way up to the top here, it will tell me um, it's giving me by the one disk I have. Um, IO stat. Uh, I think gives it a little bit better. If I had multiple disks, they would show up here. And you can then compare the disk and see, do I have a disk that's not being used at all? Uh, on, on this system, I only have one SSD drive. 
you want to map out your disk and you want to think about uh, your system bus, your controllers, your disk, and then what's on those disks. And uh, you want to create a spreadsheet of what's on the disk and uh, keep track of it both with ONSTAT and SAR. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is network performance. And this is a tricky one. Um, how do you measure the output of your network? The best test I've found is to take a two gig file and FTP it. Uh, Informix cannot read or write data faster than FTP. And uh, this is a good way to measure uh, your network performance. Uh, it's also very handy because sysadmins or network admins understand FTP. And uh, once, uh, Years ago, I was rolling out a system in 80 sites around the country, and uh, we had one or two sites uh, that would call up and say, hey, the database is down, what's wrong? And we'd go look and say, oh, the database is up and running. Uh, and uh, you could ping uh, their site, and their site could ping the database, and whatnot, would, would everything work fine. And uh, the way I finally came up with a solution was to take a two gig file and FTP it between the database and their server. And then they started getting network errors. And then I could show that to the network admin and they could say, okay, we have to do something. So um, you want to look at, at this and take a two gig file and, and do it at a test. Uh, when I roll out systems now that are going to be on multiple sites, first thing I do is FTP a two gig file just to see how long it takes. And that gives me a baseline measure for what the performance will be. And while you're doing that, look at I errors and O errors to check the, uh, the stats uh, to see if there are any errors uh, or collisions. If they are, uh, then you have problems. Okay, uh, I know I've run a little bit over time here. I see there are a lot of questions and you guys have had a great discussion here. Uh, it's hard to monitor the discussion and uh, and in answer questions. So let me, I'm gonna go through the chat. I'm gonna start at the beginning. Uh, and uh, Jacob had a question at the very beginning, is SHM all in KB or bytes? And that is a very good question. That's why I put together this spreadsheet, <laughs> Jacob, uh, to translate uh, between uh, KB and bytes. Uh, it's in uh, bytes. Uh, and, um, I like to translate it because uh, because it, it's it's helpful to know what they are. So when you put them in uh, in the kernel uh, in sys control, it's uh, in in bytes, uh, and then you, I've got a little spreadsheet here that translates that to gigabits for me. Uh, going back, uh, how big the huge pages will be? Each huge page. Yeah, you asked uh, it already. Yeah, for the four meg. Yep, you saw that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we talked about the date time stamps. Uh, and then Mark had a good point on SP2 on Power 7. Uh, I, I agree completely with that. And somebody else had a point in here on SP4 on kernel. On Power eight, I think that's true too. That's that was my recommendations in the slides. Uh, I think that's that's a great uh, setting. Uh, any other questions? Well, you guys, this has been fun. I hope this has been felt helpful. Um, this is. Uh, sort of one of the, the things we do in our performance tuning class. In fact, we spend uh, one of the labs is working with some of these kernel parameters and trying different kernel parameters out uh, to, to see what's going on there. Uh, 
the question always comes up is when are the slides going to be available? It'll take me about uh, two days to get the webcast uh, converted and on YouTube and the slides, let's say by Monday, uh, they should definitely be available. Um, our next webcast is June 21st uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, range. Uh, think of this as a new version of formatting, uh, fragmentation, and partitioning that works really good and is automatic. And it's like once I, I started using this, I'm like, I don't know why I haven't been using this in every place. It makes all your fragmentation uh, uh, issues a lot easier to manage. Uh, so instead of every year having to set up uh, fragments, uh, this automatically does it for you. And we'll talk about that uh, then. Uh, just a, a, oh, I see another question came through. 500 gig. Yes, Frank. Uh, Frank had a question here. Uh, it has 500 gigs of memory. Can I give informants 200 to 300 gigs? So the question is yes. It depends if you have anything else running on that system. If you have a big uh, web server or something like a geospatial uh, process, uh, then you need to leave enough memory for that. I usually say you could give Informix 90% of the memory on a box uh, if nothing but the database is running. Uh, but if you have 4GL programs, anything else that runs, uh, you got to save some memory for them. Uh, training, I need to just briefly touch on this. We had an advanced class that filled up. It was great back in February. I've done two private advanced classes. Uh, and, and the advanced class, think of it as four days of benchmarking. Uh, if you have four people, and that's all it takes uh, to make a private class worth it, uh, and we can do them online. Uh, I did one class where I went on site, but then we all uh, VPN back into our servers here to do the whole class uh, here on our servers. Uh, but, and I've done other other private classes where I sit here in our training room and everybody else is remote. Uh, next week we have a Informix for new databases. I'm really excited about it. That class is full. Uh, the next class is in September and I've already got two registrations for September. Uh, so I, my guess is September may fill up. Um, and. Uh, as soon as we get one student registered, uh, we won't cancel a course. Um, and uh, but please remember, our courses do fill up. The limitation, and this I want to show. This is not a final picture. I'll have a better picture next week. Uh, we got new training servers. We have eight training servers, so our limit is eight students, and. Uh, we have it set up right now where four can be in the classroom and then four remote. Uh, so th those are hard limits. Um, I want a lot of elbow room, so that's why I limit it to four in the classroom and four remote. Uh, the servers have eight cores. They've got 16 gigs of RAM. They have one SSD drive, and we've got a bunch of older disk drives in them, which aren't very good. Uh, but they're a lot of fun. and and. It means we can uh, we can do uh, some work with a lot of data in these classes. Uh, just a little bit about advanced data tools. All we do is Informix, and uh, everything from doing health checks, consulting, training, uh, and project development. And with that, I'll say thank you guys. Uh, this has been a lot of fun uh, doing this webcast, and I will see you again in June. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll sign off and uh, end things. Thank you.